Hello, and welcome to Supplementary Lecture 2 for Session 1 of GIS for Geoscientists. I hope you enjoyed the first Supplementary Lecture. This one will be a bit briefer, a bit more focused. Uh, we're going to be concerning ourselves primarily with coordinate systems and projections. This is not going to be the last word on this topic. I wanted to create this video to provide more time to reflect on what coordinate systems are and what we're doing when we're projecting data. Um, this is something we're going to do hands on in session two. And I'm going to talk more again, I'm going to reemphasize these theories and concepts during session two. But having this primer, I think, will make all of your lives a lot easier. This is probably one of the trickiest concepts to get into if you're relatively new to GIS. And for those of you who've used GIS before, it's something that may have been an afterthought. It was probably something that was in bold on all of your assignments and your textbooks that you need to think about this. But the goal here is to give you that context for understanding why it's actually important. And frankly, it's the most important thing you do when you're working in GIS, is thinking about projection systems. And once you get the hang of it, it's not that complicated, but it does take some thinking. <laughs> so here we go. Coordinates are what we use to define where we are on the Earth. This is a very straightforward idea. Um, all of us have interacted with coordinate systems in some capacity, especially as Earth scientists. We're some of the most well-suited to uh, think through these problems compared to other natural scientists. You're all familiar with the geographic coordinate system, latitude and longitude. And many of us, uh, particularly in the, in the UK, I think as well as the US and many other countries, there are national grid systems which use uh, X and Y or easting and northing coordinates, which are expressed in meters rather than degrees, minutes, seconds, like latitude and longitude. The difference between these two types of coordinate systems, the uh, easting, northing, and the latitude, longitude type systems, is given by the fact that they're in linear versus angle, angular units. And this will come into play as we start to break down what the co what components of a coordinate system actually are. But just key words to learn here, projected coordinate system versus geographic coordinate system, for your purposes at this stage, just means linear units versus angular units. It's an important thing to keep in mind, and you'll understand why this is an important distinction shortly. So, when you think about where something is on the surface of the Earth, it might seem quite straightforward, particularly if you've done geological mapping. You can see it, you can put your pen on the map, draw it on, and move on. However, it's not as straightforward as geological mapping may make it appear. The most kind of conceptual reason why it's not as straightforward as it appears is when you're looking at a 2D map, you're already looking at something that's been radically distorted. Maps are two-dimensional expressions of our Earth's three-dimensional surface. And in getting from 3D to 2D, you have to do quite a bit of math to convert that 3D structure to a two-dimensional structure. That act of transformation introduces distortion. It doesn't matter how you do it. There's no way to avoid distorting something. If you need proof of this, I ask you to grab an orange or any similar sort of citrus fruit, try unpeeling it, and try to find a way to take that skin and flatten it out without either changing the shape, pressing it down. You, you're going to distort the skin of that orange peel in some capacity uh, while you're trying to make it two-dimensional. There's no way around it. This becomes even more complicated when we consider the fact that the Earth isn't actually a sphere. So it's not just as simple as taking a sphere, or even a perfectly spherical orange, and taking the skin off and flattening it down. You're taking a much more mathematically complex object, an oblate spheroid or a geoid, as we understand today, defining the shape of the Earth, and then converting that to two dimensions. So that makes the math and the, the computational processing even more tricky. And the, and the final two elements, bit, bit smaller scale, but still really important, are the actual error that went into making your spatial measurement and the physical location of the object changing through time. With regards to error, when you're doing geological mapping, for instance, or say you're at an active volcano and you're marking down points on the map where the lava flow is projected to go, 
the error is a function of the width of your pen, you know, how shaky your hand is, how accurately you're actually placing yourself on the map, which, you know, you could confirm in, when using different geometric techniques, but there's still error built into where you're placing yourself. And when you scale this to a computational level, even when we're working with data, there's an error underlying the locations that we're looking at on the computer in a GIS software. And it's important to understand that when we're talking about coordinates, these aren't fixed objects that are just pure data. They have error bars associated with them, just like any other data set. And uh, a more geological error or sort of uh, concept to keep in mind is that, you know, any object on the surface of the earth is changing all the time with respect to time itself. We are on moving plates, shifting ground laterally over the surface of the earth. And in some locations of the earth, we may be seeing uh, rises and falls due to deflation, inflation, isostatic rebound, all sorts of geological processes. So actually saying where you are on the earth is quite complicated when you actually drill down into what you're doing when you're saying where you are. And the way we have to do this is we, we have to use a, a variety of tools all based around these problems I've identified about distortions and about errors and movement through time. And there's two main tools that we use to, to do kind of fix this location on the surface. The first is a reference system or a datum. This this is a description of the shape of the Earth that we're defining our location relative to. The reference system is something that today is quite standardized, but there are still different models that we use to say, you know, what are we taking our location with respect to? Because that's kind of the fundamental important task that, that we're doing with all sort of spatial data. The next, and, the, and the, tr the one that really trips people up most commonly is a projection, which is the mathematical transformation of the spherical coordinates defined with respect to the datum into Cartesian or linear coordinates. So that projection, we'll talk about a bit more here, and we definitely talk about at length in session two, is there are many different ways you can actually do this conversion and each has its pluses and its minuses. And the use of a particular projection depends on what your specific use case is. And then, like I said, the coordinates, they still depend on the underlying error of the measurement. That could be the error of the GPS device you use or the estimated human error of physically placing things on a paper map. And there's also the error with respect to how, you know, the location of the object is changing with time. If it's a glacier, obviously it's moving with time. Volcanoes obviously move, and we're seeing quite a few on the surface of the Earth move right now. So these are kind of so errors and sort of the change in position. These are quantities that you do have to define when you're talking about where you are on the surface of the Earth. Going back to, uh, to the supplementary lecture number one, this is part of that spatial metadata that you need to report when you're actually talking about your location. Just tying it all back. Without properly thinking through how you're defining coordinate systems and how you're reporting your projection systems, you can't, ver you can't be confident that you're being accurate with any spatial task you're taking on. So no matter how sophisticated your spatial model, your geostatistical test, your interpolation, it doesn't matter if you haven't properly considered the source of your coordinates and the type of projection system you're using and setting up the map. This is by far the most important thing you have to do with any GIS project, and you need to do it first before anything else. So with that in mind, I want to drill into two more topics specifically. I want to break down what I'm talking about when I say reference system, and I want to break down what I'm talking about when I say projection, so that you have a better conceptual understanding of these two terms. Critically, I'm going to avoid math here, it is helpful to understand the math of how we get to these types of models, but for our purposes here, it's not important. You can take a geodetic course if you really want to know how we do this. And for anyone who wants to work in satellite operations, I'm, you will certainly have to understand that math. But for our purposes, for understanding how to use GIS as geoscientists, it's not productive for me to spend a bunch of time defining the math. So we're just going to leave this at a conceptual level here. And I'll point you to resources you can go to if you want to learn more. 
So to start with the data, we as a human species have been trying to define the datum, the reference system for the earth uh, for quite a long time, for, for centuries before the beginning of the common era. Uh, Pythagoras and Aristotle reasoned that the Earth was spherical quite early on. Uh, this was done through simple geometric reasoning. And as we've gone through the ages, the mathematical tools at our disposal have only increased the accuracy of our measurements to a pretty astounding degree of accuracy when you consider how vast the Earth is and how computational tools were not as sophisticated 2,000 years ago as they are today. Um, I've listed a few of the sort of key characters in this, in this movement to quantify the shape of the Earth here. And I just want to highlight a few of them. As early as, you know, 200 BCE or so, Aristosthenes in modern-day Libya got the circumference of the Earth to within 4% of the current accepted value, which is pretty remarkable given the simple tools, the quite simple tools that, that were available at the time. As we start progressing into the Common Era, Scientists like Aryabhata and particularly Abu Raihan Biruni, the two of them uh, separately were able to make incredibly accurate estimates of the uh, equatorial circumference in the case of Aryabhata and in uh, Earth's radius in the case of uh, Abu Biruni, uh, with the latter's measurement of the radius standing as the most accurate measurement until about two to three hundred years ago. Um, so standing for more than half a millennia, uh, which is really remarkable. And that was possible due to advances in spherical trigonometry that allowed Biruni and others to actually conceptualize the, the shape of a sphere and then break it down to figure out what the actual components of the Earth would look like mathematically. So uh, as more mathematical tools became available during the European Enlightenment, uh, geographers were able to characterize the Earth and able to show not just conceptually but experimentally that the Earth was an ellipsoid. And this, this is really the next revolution after Biruni and others sort of set the standard for quantifying the spherical shape of the Earth, the discovery that the Earth is actually an ellipsoid thanks to Newtonian dynamics and advances in other mathematical sciences really pushed the envelope for figuring out how the Earth actually looked. And this ellipsoid concept we still use today, though we understand that the Earth is still even more complicated than an ellipsoid. It's, it's a very lumpy object, actually, in, in its most detailed shape. But an ellipsoid is a good approximation for how we understand the Earth today. What you see on the left is a, an exaggerated example of our modern understanding of the Earth's shape. And that is represented by the, the concept of a geoid which is, a, I'll talk a bit more about in a moment, but it's essentially a gravitational description of the Earth's shape with respect to a reference ellipsoid that you know, is something we'd expect from more simple geometric constraints. This lumpiness here is probably due to processes familiar to many of you. Efficient, essentially, excesses and deficiencies in mass lead to uh, higher or lower areas of gravity. Um, and that defines what we use as our data today um, when we think about reference systems. Getting this geoid, though, this didn't come through spherical trigonometry. It actually came from, for, for many of you, maybe from a source you've never heard of. And that was a woman named Gladys West. And I want to take this moment just to highlight her because we can't talk about reference systems without talking about the woman who gave us GPS and gave us the modern altimetry tools that actually make quantifying the shape of the Earth computationally possible. We wouldn't have any GIS without Gladys West. So I just, I really would encourage all of you outside this supplementary uh, lecture, I'll, I'll post the link to this if I can, um, to this article. Uh, she, she was a remarkable wooden, woman, a hidden figure um, like other black female scientists in the United States in the mid 20th century. And in the 1970s, after spending decades hand coding computers, um, she led a small team to develop the accurate geodetic model for the shape of the Earth that was the building block for GPS. And her geodetic model became the reference ellipsoid that um, most, most modern GPS systems are built around. There is a, a similar, a slightly different European model, but it's built off the same kinds of advances that Gladys West made. 
Um, she's a remarkable woman. I encourage you all to look her up and to appreciate the amazing contribution she made to science. Uh, the article's really interesting because, uh, yeah, she's she's got quite a lot to say. <laughs> um, so, uh, so with that history lesson kind of in mind, the, the key point that I wanted to get across there was the, the actual act of calculating the shape of the Earth. There are lots of different ways you can do it, but today we do it thanks to Gladys West, using out to, essentially using um, computational tools uh, and satellites primarily now. Um, so when we... So when we take our mathematical description of the shape of the Earth, defined by, uh, given as sort of a, a, given as this geoid object that I introduced in the previous slide, um, we, we are able to construct our horizontal and our vertical reference systems, defining the position of an object on the Earth relative to the ellipsoid, the geoid. Um, so this, this geographic coordinate system, this, this reference system, uh, is, is there are several sort of models kicking around. One of the most common ones you'll see is WGS84, which we will become very familiar with over the course of this workshop series. And thankfully, you don't have to do any of this math. I sort of sketched out the history. People like Gladys West did the hard work. And now GIS software has come loaded in with these reference systems. The, po the point where you come in is you have to then decide if you need to work in linear units, if you need to know things scaled to meters, centimeters, millimeters, kilometers, in any capacity for your map, whether that's measuring distance, or volume, or speed, or, or any other parameter, you then need to project that map. Because if you just stick with WGS84 or any other sort of geographic coordinate system and just use the reference system, you're, even if you're looking at a 2D map, you're only working in angular units. You're working at latitude, longitude type units. And the results of any calculations you do, even if they're expressed in meters, even if the software tells you that, you are operating on a three-dimensional surface. You haven't actually done the math yet to extract, to break that surface down into a 2D plane, which can then be operated on in a way that's more familiar to you. Now, for anyone who does like plate reconstruction models, this might not be an issue. Uh, and also, if you do plate reconstruction models, you probably know all of this already, all these principles I'm going through. Um, but for most of us, for volcanologists in particular, who many of you taking this course are, um, we're not comfortable working in angular units. We don't want to be able to express a uh, lava flow rate in you know, minutes, uh, minutes per <laughs> or, or angles per hour. You know, that's not, it's not a useful unit for us. So you're going to need to take the next step, and that's projecting. And this is where you, the user, come in, and where you have to make a conscious choice about which mathematical transformation you're going to use to take this geodetically defined reference system, your position made in reference to that, take that three-dimensional description, and then flatten it out into a 2D plane. There are probably thousands of different ways you can do this. Cartographers and geodeticists have been very thorough in exploring all the sort of different per permutations of ways that you can flatten a map into two dimensions. Um, all of them have their pros and all of them have their cons. And some of these projection systems, one in particular has been the source of a lot of controversy in recent decades. Um, and I'm gonna take a moment here to highlight this most popular projection systems and kind of examine how projection systems work and also analyze some of the pitfalls of relying on sort of standard software projection systems. So this most famous of projection systems is the Mercator projection. And if any of you have taken a geography class, you may have already been introduced to this. Um, to give you a bit of background, if this is unfamiliar to you, it was defined by a Flemish cartographer, Mercator, in 1569. Um, it was designed for navigation. That was its primary purpose. And the reason it's so great for navigation and why it took off so immediately and became very popular with cartographers is it preserves local directions and shapes. This makes it a conformal projection, which means that every angle between two curves that cross each other on this map 
um, preserve, or, or preserve that angle when they're flat. So you're able to actually describe, you're able to draw on shipping lanes and preserve that accuracy um, with scale across great distances. So it's really useful for navigators. And as you can imagine for um, shipping, uh, which in the 16th century in Europe beyond became very important for uh, you know, some very questionable reasons. Um, the, so the, the math behind it, again, I'm not gonna get into the math here, but this conformal projection, the downside to a conformal projection like the Mercator system is that it inflates the size of objects away from the equator, uh, the equator, increasing exponentially up to the poles. And you see this reflected in this diagram from the, um, from the Encyclopedia Britannica, which shows how when you project this conformal system onto a, a, a cylinder, which is what uh, Mercator wanted to do, it, it, it ends up stretching the, the northern and southern bits of the map uh, substantially. It makes Russia look massive. It makes Canada, the United States, and Greenland look absolutely, you know, ridiculously large. Um, and because this map was so prized by navigators and because it was so easy to make, because it stretched so evenly, um, and it still preserved local shape and directions accurately, it became like the standard atlas projection for classroom maps, for at-home atlases, up until the mid 20th century, it was very common. And for me and lots of other American school children, this was probably the map you had um, on, you know, behind your blackboard at school. For, for, for obvious reasons, this scaling of the, north, the northern countries of the world, Europe and North America, um, has, has come under scrutiny in, in recent decades, not just scientifically, which there are many reasons why this is not scientifically sound in some cases, and I'll show why in a moment, but obviously there are colonial and political reasons why this is not a desirable projection system to use as a world map. And Mercator himself recognized this and you know, recommended that this map not be used as an atlas accompaniment, but this be used for navigational purposes. So uh, this is a really critical lesson here. Projections have their uses. And the Mercator projection, if you're working on navigation problems, is absolutely one of the better projection systems you can use. And if you're working on the equator, if you're working in South America or Central Africa, the Mercator projection is fine. It works okay pretty much for any purpose you would need. But if you're working anywhere above really 35, 40 degrees latitude, you are, you, the Mercator projection may not be the right decision for you. And I'll show why on the next slide. So this is a comparison that uh, I found on Twitter and I thought was too good to pass up to share with you. And this is the true size of a country shown in dark blue against the Mercator projection size of the country. And again, because a conformal projection system doesn't preserve size, it only preserves shape, the, the scale of these countries, I mean, when you actually look at this map and you think about how you've always been shown maps before, it really brings home how badly the Mercator projection distorts size at scale. Um, and in particular, if, if you're studying the Icelandic eruption, uh, I, would, I would say any map you make, I would encourage you to avoid the Mercator projection. Because if you have any underlying error in your estimate of where a particular vent is found or the extent of a lava flow, that spatial coordinate data and the underlying error scales with the underlying projection system error. And if you're using the Mercator projection, that means you're really introducing a lot more uncertainty into your measurement of where something is on the surface. The reason that I take this time to kind of point out the flaws in Mercator is again, it's such a common projection system. It's actually often the default in many softwares. If you use Google Maps or any mapping software on your cell phone where you can zoom in and out easily, um, the web Mercator projection, which is a slightly modified version of Mercator, is the default projection system. And again, it's because of ease of use, because it's conformal, it's really easy to scale when it comes to you zooming in and zooming out on the map. But it means that when you zoom all the way out of Google Maps on your phone, Greenland looks like it's the size of Africa, when in reality, it's not. <laughs> um, so these are things to be aware of. And while it seems like I've gone a bit away from the goal of the course, 
The reason I emphasize this is that you need to make sure you're making decisions about projection systems that reflect these realities. Every projection system distorts either in terms of shape or, or, or size in some, in some capacity. There are other conformal projection systems that maybe don't distort things the same way as the Mercator projection, but they still cause distortion. Uh, we will use a projection system in, uh, for our exercise in exercise two that distorts most of the world pretty badly, but works really well for South America. Um, and that means that when you make your choice about projection systems and how you describe the actual location of your data on the Earth's surface, you need to be cognizant of the, of the problems that may come into play with that projection system, of the uncertainties of that projection system, and you need to report it. Going back to that lesson from supplementary lecture one, you need to report these things. And I'll leave you with this uh, wonderful GIF from the website, thetruesizeof.com. Again, from the same uh, Twitter user, uh, Neil, Neil K, who you should definitely follow. This, uh, this website is wonderful to play around with if you want to kind of blow your mind a bit about you know, the way scale is represented on these maps. And this is showing a transposing of Mexico and Greenland, just to see how much the Mercator projecting system actually distorts things uh, as you move towards northern latitudes. So hopefully through some bit of history and a bit of a contextual description and sort of high level conceptual discussions, hopefully this supplementary lecture has left you with more, a better understanding of how we use coordinate systems and what projection systems are as applied to GIS data. Like I said, this is supposed to be kind of encapsulated all on its own. If some of these concepts are still confusing to you, session two will address those uncertainties by allowing you to really get your hands dirty and work with projected systems yourself. Um, with that, I thank you for your attention on this uh, unintentionally slightly longer lecture than I, I planned. Um, but I thank you for your time and I look forward to seeing you in the next supplemental lecture or in our session on Wednesday. Have a good day.